Today's episode is a wild ride through mythical creatures, monsters, fabulous beasts, Frankenstein, goblins, orcs, and ogres. Stay tuned. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Hey guys, welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the show where we become better role players and better game masters by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. I am very excited today to have a repeat guest on the show, so you do not want to miss this episode. My guest today is writer, professor, and monster expert, as well as the host of the Monster Professor podcast, Josh Woods. Josh, welcome on the show. Thanks for having me back, man. It's a it's a real pleasure and an honor. And congrats on the on the success from the podcast. I know we just chatted about this just a second ago off air, but I want to make it official. Congrats <laughs> on your progress with the podcast. It's looking awesome. You have some great episodes. Uh, huh. Impressive. Thank you very much. And, and yes, as you mentioned, uh, just for the listeners, uh, Josh was on episode three of the podcast. So he is re- a returning guest and I am very grateful that he is coming back. Uh, well, thank you for your kind words about the podcast. I still am not 100% sure of what I'm doing, I, uh, <laughs> but uh, I get to talk to some really cool people. So I am having a blast. <laughs> Yeah, I think the day that you figure it out, like, oh, I know what I'm doing now, then it's dead. You know, like <laughs> Nietzsche said, we only we only have words for those things that are already dead in our hearts. And I think you only you only feel like you get it by the time you're ready to move on to something else, I think. So that you don't know what you're doing still tells me that you're exact, you're doing exactly what you should be doing. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, yeah. So, well, we'll see. So right now, yes, I still have no idea what I'm doing. So I guess I'm fresh and <laughs> still ready to go <laughs> and try out some new things with the podcast here. Today, we're going to talk about hopefully a number of different topics regarding monsters. Just to start things off, and I guess I should mention, uh, you you were gracious enough to have me on your show as well on the monster professor and when i was on there you asked me a question i guess you asked most of your guests what is uh, your favorite monster and so i said dragons later on i was talking to my wife and my wife was very uh, adamant she said i got it all wrong of course and that uh, <laughs> dragons are not monsters <laughs> dragons are <laughs> mythical creatures so i was thinking we could just start off today just what would be the difference between a monster a mythical creature, a legendary beast. As you, as the monster expert, do you have categories of these kind of creatures? <laughs> <laughs> That's a that is a tricky question. And first, I want to I want to go on record as to say that I would n- I would never call your wife wrong, and I would never <laughs> disagree with her. I have yet to meet her, but I'm sure she's right all the time. And neither do I want to come between you two on the issue of dragons as monsters. Uh, Michael Drought once said he knew a couple who divorced over the supposed date of the authoring of Beowulf. And so such things can happen. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Well, that's (laughs) taking things a little too far. Um, yeah, so dragons as monsters, you know, I have I've, um, i don't know if I mentioned this previously or not, but every now and then I'll, I'll get an email uh, from listeners and about half of the time it's an email over the category a monster fits okay. in and whether or not this thing is a monster. And so I think, I think that's a really fun and cool discussion. I tried to clarify how I define monster in one of my podcast episodes. I think it was called Monster monster definition and horror theory, although I don't remember which number episode it was. I'll I'll do my best to kind of encapsulate what counts for me as a monster, and I'll explain why, yes, I consider dragons monsters, and one episode on serpents and dragons was a deep dive into that. But I think um, I take it as a monster if it's a strange being, and by strange I mean like aberrant and extra mundane. It's either like so far out from the normal versions of the thing as to be nearly unique and or it is something that doesn't fit our typical conception of the world. And so this thing, this this strange being, uh, 
is an entity of of threat, of portent, and of the unknown. As mm-hmm. in, like this thing presents danger, it presents mystery, but it also has meaning. It's it's it, the clo- the deeper you look into it, the more that bottom seems to fall away to sort of something bottomless. I think, and so that way we can like toss out just a a, a really mean tiger for instance but something like moby dick starts to be a little bit more of a monster and jaws is on the line there but something like a demon and a ghost uh can be just as much of a monster as say fenrir or smaug or something like that i think so but with all that said um you know others have category you know there's there's the older category of fabulous beasts, yeah. uh, which are slightly different from monsters. And normally fabulous beasts and mythical creatures all kind of fall under the same thing. So, so that phrase fabulous beast is pretty, is pretty common um, in scholarship. There's one scholar named Joseph Nigg. Uh, he wrote this brilliant book on fabulous beasts and he provides in that book excer- uh, translations of excerpts of original sources of all the most vital uh, Im- fabulous beasts as they've shown up in literature. And he starts with uh, Tiamat and the Enuma Elish, which is essentially the first fully coherent kind of writing that we have. Um, all the way up until m- more recent fantasy writers. And he's got everything in between and he follows through the you know, Bible and the medieval era and all sorts of classical sources. So Joseph Nigg's Fabulous Beast and as many other books on, uh, on these kinds of beings are, are fascinating. Normally those are, are creatures that have a kind of life as if they're an animal in this world but they're supernatural or extra mundane have something else. And so that category absolutely includes dragons, but would exclude like ghosts and vampires and wraiths, that kind of thing. And so if your wife is thinking they're more like magical animals and mythological creatures than like ghouls and zombies, that's fair. That kind of distinction has been made for a long time. I had the privilege of talking with uh, Joseph Nigg on a, an episode a while back, but also Tom Shippey, uh, who is the world's premier Tolkien scholar and has been the expert that that, that uh, Peter Jackson and other Lord of the Rings and Tolkien filmmakers go to, had him on recently. And he shared with us his his taxonomy of monsters and he breaks it down starting with artificial and natural monsters. And he sees it like Mm -hmm. a tree, like each category branches off. Mm -hmm. And so he thinks over in the artificial side, you, he starts branching off toward robots and stuff like that. And the natural side, he branches it off between like animal and human. And then on the animal branch, he breaks it off between known and unknown. And the known goes off in a direction like giant spiders or something like that. In the unknown, he would put dragons and things like that. And so he would put in his taxonomy of monsters, he would just say uh, that a dragon is essentially a natural unknown animal like monster. And that's where that kind of thing fits. So I think there's plenty of room to agree to disagree on dragons as monsters. And I think there are plenty of categories that fit into, I think there, but whatever they are, um, they're, they're a special category because I think dragons represent not only the oldest type of monster that we tell stories about, but I think perhaps one of the most complex kinds of monsters. I think. Okay. So that's a bit of a ramble. I'll pause here and see where you feel like jumping in. (laughs) And I I think you're absolutely correct when you mentioned that it is possible for them to, to, to fit into perhaps a number of different categories because they are the oldest. 
and they are the most complex because, yes, whenever history began with writing, for some reason we were writing about dragons. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we got, we've got the Mesopotamian stuff, you got the Enuma Elish. Um, you know, there weren't in Gilgamesh, not really dragons. But dragon-like things. I mean, Humbaba was was kind of dragon-like. I don't. He was a bit unclear. But anyway, you you have Tiamat. You have you have hints in the Bible of a, an edited out version, the, an older version of creation in which Yahweh slays a Tiamat-like dragon, Tehom, and chops up her body and builds the world out of it. There are hints in a, a bit in Job and hints even in, in Genesis. But that's, but you know, so maybe there was something back there. But then you've got it in, you've got it in all sorts of classical sources over and over again. You've got it in Beowulf. You've got them showing up in Dante. I mean, you've got just dragons nonstop throughout literature. And what in the world they mean, man, the deeper you go down that, <laughs> the more floors you go down, the more steps there are leading to a lower floor. I do think sometimes the the categorization angle can possibly be a little bit too much because sometimes we're, even when we say monster or we say mythical creature or something, we're, I guess we're saying the same thing unless perhaps, I guess you could say something like a unicorn. Is a unicorn a mythical creature or is it a monster? It seems like it would be a mythical creature, but uh, on the other hand, um, it could possibly be a monster. What do you think about that? Yeah, I would totally. I mean, I throw everything in the, the monster thing because <laughs> I don't want to run out of subjects for my podcast. <laughs> but, I would, but I mean, like as far as my definition of monster, it, you know, it would fit that strange entity sure. thing. It would, it would fit the mystery. It would fit some type of meaning. There's more to a unicorn than just a horse with a horn on its head. In that mm-hmm. case, it's just a it's just a meaningless mutant. Of course, that's what the word. A side note: that's what the word monster originally meant. It was it was the word for this creature that was born, and presumably something that like ranchers, like those who took care of livestock. Every now and then, you would have some calf born and it would be wrong. Something would be wrong about it. It would have an extra leg or two heads or something. And very often uh, sick or dead or will soon die. And Mm -hmm. it was an omen, a bad omen, an omen of bad things to come. So when one of these things is born, one of these, what we would consider now kind of a genetic mutant or birth defect animal, Mm -hmm. um, they, they knew that that meant worse things were to come, a, a famine, a plague, a war, or something like that. And so the word for this kind of creature was monster. That's what that was. And then eventually it kind of got extended and thrown into uses in which it meant something also large or larger than life and then something evil in and of itself and all sorts of things. So with all that said, You've got the unicorn fits the strange thing. It fits the meaning. It fits the mystery. I think the only thing that would keep it from being a monster in my definition would be that threat or danger. But I'm not going to go messing around with a unicorn. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, who knows what kind of powers they have. And in legend, I think all she did was touch it and like turn the whole world into dark, freezing cold or something like that. (laughs) So I think they're dangerous enough to call a monster. Um, I think many people... People like to think that unicorns have good intentions rather than bad intentions. So maybe they're not threatening or dangerous, but I don't, I don't trust them. So I say they're <laughs> monsters. So I guess that is interesting because, uh, you know, and thank you for talking about kind of the origin of the word monster even. And um, I think that can be insightful. And I think, I think there is something to the idea that whenever you say uh, monster, there is the connotation of a threat of danger or that it is an evil creature. Maybe the unicorn is good, but this certainly doesn't mean that they're necessarily safe in some way <laughs> that, because they have very strange powers. Yeah. And in fact, the most requested episode yet that I have not yet touched is one on angels. Apparently, a lot of my listeners think angels fit as monsters and they want to hear more about angels. I very much do want to talk about angels, but that one, I've got some really 
I've got some really intense and out there ideas on angels. So I want to make sure I get all my sources lined up right before I jump into that. In fact, I wanted one of the people who was key to my, my concepts of angels was, uh, was a scholar named Harold Bloom. And I was talking with him about getting on the podcast and he just uh, a week or two ago, just passed away at 89 and still working on another book. (laughs) So, uh, so we won't get to hear uh, my talking with Harold Bloom about angels as monsters, but I'll find some way to do it eventually. And they, and they fit one of those categories. Like we like to think of them as nice things, but the people were terrified of him in the Bible. Every time an angel showed yeah, up, their reaction absolutely. was terror. And I like to think that unicorns are equally terrifying, yeah. however, also beautiful. Good intentions, but they're so alien and so powerful to us that uh, that they that they strike terror in us, even though that their intentions or their character may be good. For the subject of my podcast with role-playing games, it is always then fascinating. That would be kind of a different way to introduce a monster into a campaign where they have a good intention, but they they can terrify the characters through their power or something like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, and those are some of our favorite villains too, right? Or some of the most interesting villains and stories are those whose motivations make a lot of sense to them. Hell, I mean, even Satan and Milton's Paradise Lost, you listen to that speech, that speech could have just been taken out of his mouth and put under Thomas Jefferson's pen or something like that. Like it's this brilliant enlightenment era, natural rights speech. The one that he riles up a third of the angels in heaven to, to engage with him in in rebellion against the Lord of God. I mean, he's, and he makes so much sense. I'm totally convinced. I'm a huge Satan fan, (laughs) apparently after reading (laughs) Paradise Lost. And I don't think that was John Milton's intention, but you can tell John Milton was kind of one over himself. I mean, his Jesus and God are so dull and boring and his Satan is so brilliant and fascinating that it's part of that. It's part of that temptation that I think kind of got away from him in, in wonderfully brilliant ways. But yeah, those, those kinds of monsters and villains. Ones. They're the best. Um, that's interesting because I I am not a Satan fan, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I can totally understand uh, what you're saying from the context of Paradise Lost. Even though I I've had I've never finished it. I've only had uh, what like two abortive kind of attempts to finish the entire uh, Paradise Lost. But I, I I know what you're talking about. Um, I am a a good fan. I am a big fan of good and evil. So even if the villain is evil, there does seem to be an odd attraction whenever we whenever we have a villain. It seems like actors enjoy playing the villain parts. Um, it seems that a uh, Gollum in the Lord of the Rings becomes very fast. You know, people readers become fascinated with Gollum, uh, just things like that. Yeah, I mean, those, you know, some of the best villains, part of what makes them so fascinating is, you know, the the ones that are done really well, they're right. Like Lord of the Rings is a great example. Sometimes that's kind of marginalized as like simplistic or simple minded literature. As in, (laughs) you know, when I've heard people say it, they're like, oh, that's just black and white, good versus evil. Well, first of all, that's assuming that you can tell the freaking difference between good and evil. I and mean, clearly humans aren't quite as good at that as we think we are. And the Lord of the Rings is a very serious dive into that. Um, and then second, there are there's no clear black and white good and evil in the Lord of the Rings. You could only say that if you've never read the books. Mm-hmm. I mean, that everything's some version of gray area. And Saruman, I think, is probably one of the best kind of villains um, Mm -hmm. and very much inspired, of course, by John Milton, Satan as well, but everything Saruman says is right, you know, in a, in a political way, like he's saying, like, look, the Sauron's too powerful. There's every, every reason in the world to think that he's going to get a hold of the ring. And even if he doesn't, he doesn't need it. He can still wipe this out. It's wiser to kind of like team up with him and then do good from the inside of the system. Don't you think? (laughs) And you, but you know, that's just his, you know, that's, 
you know, that's just his playing with rhetoric or sophistry really is what it is. Um, mm-hmm. and, and all of the, all of the most brilliantly speaking and most rational characters in that book or worm tongue is another one. Uh, mm-hmm. they're all the most villainous as well, but, but they're not necessarily wrong in what they say. Um, yeah. part of, you know, part of what makes them so fascinating, I think. Yeah. Well, anybody who calls Lord of the Rings simplistic is, uh, frankly, they're insane. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they've, they've bought into a caricature kind of, of, uh, of what perhaps they've heard about in, in different things. But um, yes, the, 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 the levels of complexity there are, <laughs> are uh, outstanding because having read it, ha- having read the Lord of the Rings a number of times, at least I think six or seven times all the way, every time I read it, I find something deeper in it. Um, of course, you know, good and evil is going to be muddled because, you know, kind of the ability or the desire or the taintedness in all of us to do evil as well. And so um, when confronted with those things, it's it's a matter of these choices that we make. The Lord of the Rings is beautiful in in showing those things, just like you were saying with Sar- you know, Saruman. He has this, he has these ideas, and these are going to be great. But of course, uh, they corrupt him, and uh, he doesn't even see it. Where we see, you know, Frodo even holding the ring. Of course, he can't give up the ring and that power willingly. Um, only Sam <laughs> can give it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Bilbo did to Sam, but even the Sam was more reluctant than Bilbo and there was an odd little those were a couple of odd little moments the thing Tolkien does so well is to make some of the most miraculous moments seem so humble and small and quiet but mm-hmm. I mean in in his in his conception and, it, and it's a very much a, a Christian or a Catholic conception mm-hmm. of, of evil and I think it's one that kind of bears out in in the world you know, IRL, as the kids might say, is that the the great the greatest of all are the ones that fall the farthest. You know, Saruman was the lead wizard, and so he becomes the worst. Um, Sauron, you know, was the lead, mm-hmm. and then he fell. Melkor Morgoth was the was the top of the celestial pile, and he fell worse uh, than any others. And yeah. so the higher up you are, the, the deeper you are to fall, given into pride and, and self-certainty and that kind of rationality and those yeah. kinds of monsters. And, well, I mean, you can see that across other types of fiction as well in in the tragic fall of the the one who was most monstrous monstrous of all like victor frankenstein since we <laughs> chatted about frankenstein he's one of those he was most brilliant the, essentially the most brilliant man alive in his in his fictional version of earth and became essentially the worst of them mm-hmm. all and, uh, and of course, that uh, that goes back to Satan as well. That uh, yeah. Satan was the the highest angel, of course, and and then fell. But yes, and as you bring up uh, uh, Frankenstein, we did chat a little off air about uh, talking about Frankenstein. Um, I guess we can uh, segue into that because yes, Victor Frankenstein was the, the best medical student in that story, and he's uh, does something right <laughs> that that causes his downfall. But just thank. Speaking of Frankenstein, like the work, just kind of uh, it just kind of boggles my mind to think that um, you know this book now that's a little over two hundred years old just lives in our culture so much and has just permeated our culture so much that even you know two and three year old children will say the name Frankenstein, of course, because they see the images around Halloween and and different things like that. That I even remember in my own experience, right? You know, growing up, it's just you know you just know of Frankenstein and there's at least when I was growing up on on uh, you know the the four TV channels that we had back in the dark ages or whatever of the <laughs> 1980s was um, you know there was there was always a Frankenstein movie on TV or something and then being in college and actually reading the novel and just being struck with how much 
the the novel is nothing like the movies that, that we see and <laughs> yeah. um there are some names that are the same victor frankenstein and things like that but um there is very little in common with the film versions as opposed to the novel and um and uh, like i said i, I kind of wanted to talk about you know frankenstein a little bit maybe uh you can just kind of tell us uh what are some of your just kind of general thoughts on frankenstein either the novel or or, or film adaptations. Yeah, I mean, you're you're exactly right in pointing out that Frankenstein has become an i like an iconic part of our culture and, and an integral part of our culture, and, and for good reason, I think. Um, but that has been helped out quite a bit by the Universal Studio image, <laughs> the Boris Karloff image of that, which, as you point out, is is a, is a far cry from how it plays out in the in the novel and even like even victor frankenstein i think in the movies they let him go ahead and finish his medical degree and call him doctor (laughs) i mean it's essentially a dropout med student right (laughs) young little kid i think he was you know i think it was done well there was a uh tv series for a while called penny dreadful and and they had a they had a version of victor frankenstein where he's just like this arrogant little twerp of a young 20 year old who's just absolutely brilliant um and so i think that's i think that's a good image perhaps of (laughs) of mary shelley's frankenstein yeah i mean it's i think it's wow like why why is it so iconic or what's up with well first of all i i i I will let it be known that i'm perfectly happy calling Victor Frankenstein, Frankenstein, and calling his creation also <laughs> Frankenstein. <laughs> and um, not only because that's just the way our culture has kind of decided unconsciously and informally that that's how it's going to be. But mm-hmm. we do that with other things. Like when you see a DeLorean running down the road, you don't go, oh, that's one of John DeLorean's cars. <laughs> no, you just say that's a DeLorean or that's a Ford, not that's a Henry Ford's model of vehicle and so you can call it a frankenstein because frankenstein made it usually when i see a delorean i say great scott (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's a that's a more appropriate i just saw one the other day and i'm thinking where are they getting these things i thought there were only like three thousand left and and that's like the second or third one i've seen this year anyway (laughs) okay um (laughs) a frankenstein uh, okay (laughs) yeah yeah frankenstein which is as cool as a delorean (laughs) Um, Yeah, my image of Frankenstein in the book was something quite a bit different than the clunky kind of like, you know, like blocky zombie that that the Universal Studios made him. Um, An image... The image that was in my mind, I I think, was best reflected in a complete, well, not completely unrelated movie. Um, There were these like alien prequels, Ridley Scott ones called Prometheus or this film Prometheus. Mm -hmm. And in there, he kind of made the space jockeys, the uh, these these like gigantic like Paragon, not Paragon. well, yeah, paragon. They have paragons of humans. Uh, they're like these gigantic figures of everything, like a perfect human would be if you also scaled them up to like ten feet tall and carved them out of marble or something like that. And when I read Frankenstein, that's how I envisioned the creation is that because he was put together in this horribly perfect symmetry and so it looks both like beautiful and horrifying simultaneously Mm. i think a lot of those like large marble sculptures you might see in museums like the rodan sculptures they're that Mm. they're kind of like horrifying and beautiful simultaneously um and so but instead he kind of became just a just kind of a stitched together clunky golem like thing in the <laughs> films which is perfectly fine i think um but i mean w- there are a few better images of a story of like someone taking someone you know over the overreach of science and progress which is exactly mm-hmm. the kind of thing you know mary shelley and and you know, Piercy, Bicey Shelley and Lord Byron and all the romantics were really wanting to get at is like this 
look at look at the dangers and the horrors that are out there in the in the world in addition to the beauty this kind of pure rationality pure enlightenment era all progress kind of mode needs to be checked a little bit and i don't think there's any story that that does that better on top of that you get this this image uh of playing out of what the enlightenment era folks would like to think like like the Sam Harris's of the world want everybody to just wake up as a Vulcan, like purely emotionless <laughs> with no, with believing with a blank slate of a mind and accepting nothing in the world that isn't first evidenced by facts. And that even includes like Sam Harris's meditation. Actually, that's a weird thing for him. So maybe he's not the best example, no, a Richard Dawkins or something like that. I don't know. Um, and so this kind of image of the the image of the of the blank slate kind of perfect enlightenment man what if you took a fully developed person and you got to you got to wipe clean any bad influences of nurture and you perfected nature what would you get then you would get the perfect man then you get yeah. the new christ or something like that or the new adam, adam right and then and instead what you got is everything goes wrong and it all turns against you and that's and that's a that's a beautiful lesson to yeah. learn on top of that you know you talked about a lot there but i think the kind of the science crossing a line or progress crossing a line of course is one of the themes that stays kind of intact but yeah reading you know reading the novel this image of you know the classic image of boris karloff of course as you mentioned doesn't fit at all even though the creature is called hideous and horrible kind of throughout the the novel you get this idea i think at some point it's described i can't remember the exact word but it's almost like luscious long black hair or something you know yeah. i can't remember if that's the right word but it's just like but something with the i think as the eyes or something that like give away that strike as alien or or something is different. It, yeah, and like it's the not yellow this, eyes, I think, or something, some sort of jaundiced-like eyes. Yeah, watery eyes. Yeah. Something, yeah. And I think that you know really struck me. But I I hear you know that uh, that there were some play versions, you know, some theatrical stage play versions of Frankenstein that made him more the brute that the that the film kind of the the classic uh, James Whale film with Boris Karloff uh, kind of drew from. To to make him a brute. And I, you know, I, I just found that kind of fascinating because I, I remember seeing a, a quote and I'll paraphrase something from Boris Karloff saying like in one of the movies they were like, you know, they wanted to make him talk and all this stuff. And Boris Karloff was like, that's ridiculous. He should be, a, you know, just a brute. Or, and, and I just thought that, you know, that was uh, kind of interesting because, well, number one, it robbed us of hearing, you know, Boris Karloff's incredible voice. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. But then it also, in the novel, the creature reads paradise lost as we we've already mentioned paradise <laughs> lost he reads paradise lost and some other you know classical works i mean the creature is like the most intelligent articulate you know person almost in the in the whole story it's just interesting then how the movies des decide to make him a brute instead of this articulate rational creature yeah because i mean at. he's He's absolutely like not only is he stronger and faster and hardier, but he's much more brilliant than any other person who just happened to be born. Like he was, he was designed. I mean, Victor Frankenstein did it quite well. He just uh, didn't think how the whole thing, how the gestalt would look <laughs> in its entirety <laughs> once it's done. But other than yeah. that, like he made him potentially as brilliant as anybody ever has. And then he, you know, has to provide a self-education, of course, and then gets mm -hmm. to that level of intelligence. And and we haven't really seen that on film. I, I guess the the one with Kenneth Branagh, and I, maybe he made it. I don't know if I can't yeah. remember. Anyway, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein film. I think it was in the '90s where Robert where De Niro. Um, yeah, yeah, Robert De Niro. Yeah, and I think Robert De Niro said something like he wanted to play the creature like a like a like he came out of surgery, like a stroke victim, uh, mm -hmm. and so he kind of played him as a guy who was kind of thoughtful but gloomy and kind of struggling with having undergone a stroke coming back from life. And I'm I wouldn't go that direction either. I would <laughs> I would go I would go like the perfect Ubermensch is yeah. the monster but one who's also pitiable because that scene 
I, every time I go back to reread it, I have, I struggle so much. It gets me, man. That scene where, where Victor Frankenstein brings the thing to life yeah. and he sees it and he's horrified. And so he runs upstairs and takes a nap, he like stress naps over it. <laughs> and then he wakes up and the poor monster's just been like, or the poor creation has just been like brought into this world and left alone. And he's yeah. horrified. And then he finds him like a puppy and he's just like wants some companionship. And then the little twit that he is, Victor Frankenstein just <laughs> brushes him off and like goes to his friend's house to hang out because he's too stressed out even thinking about it. Oh, it breaks my heart. I can't stand it. Oh my goodness. I think there's, a, you know, obviously there's a lot going on there and it is just, uh, it's just so fascinating on a number of levels because, you know, here you have, um, you know, Mary Shelley, this young woman who's, you know, 17, 18 when she's writing this. And then also, just to pick up some themes in her own life, that when she was born, her mother died in childbirth. So her life came from a death. She had a child that died as a baby. So kind of, and she had dreams of that child still living. So this idea of bringing the dead back to life. And then, of course, her father disowned her when she ran off with uh, Percy Shelley. So every time we see the creature, when he goes mad and when he becomes homicidal <laughs> is when he's being rejected. I don't know. I just find that just kind of fascinating on a number of levels. Yeah. I mean, I think it was, I think I first heard uh, this take on it from Guillermo del Toro in some interview when he was saying like Frankenstein is a teen angst novel written by an angsty teen. I'm like, no, it wasn't written by an angsty teen. Oh yeah, it was, wasn't it? It was written by a freaking teenager. Mm -hmm. And we're still, and it's, you know, it's embedded itself as a, one of the most significant pieces of literature in our culture. And, mm -hmm. and what about it is the angsty teen thing. It's like you have, you're now this kind of pseudo adult creature, but you kind of have the experience of a child, but all the capabilities of, a, of an adult as a late teen you resent your family for not raising you well enough or bringing you into this God awful world, but you also don't know what to do with yourself, but you feel both abandoned and rejecting simultaneously. And I mean, that's, that's everything in the novel. So it is a teen angsty novel and it's YA as well. <laughs> it's great literature. <laughs> and of course, you know, we have mentioned the uh, kind of the theme of science gone too far or the progress gone too far kind of idea. Also another theme that is, that can't be ignored of course, is the, why am I here? Why am? Why did you create me? What is my purpose? I, I think that that might speak to us on a little deeper level uh, that people don't may not realize sometimes. But in the novel, the the creature is just seems to be just seems to be begging for an answer to that question just over and over again. I don't know if that was if you saw that before. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's and I think that's a part that is so brilliantly brought, drawn out by the setting as well. It begins and ends in the Arctic, like this bleak landscape of. Uh, I mean, if you want to like, if you have an existential dilemma and you're looking for the outward setting that reflects that inward state, <laughs> I mean, what can you find better than the, the than being lost in the in the ice wilderness of the Arctic? And then that's where we see the last image of the creation like floating off on a chunk of ice with his with his dead creator in his arms like what if you're like what does it all mean is captured in that image perhaps as strongly as anything we've ever seen it's brilliant it's fascinating how the novel you know the story of frankenstein has become a true modern myth right it's the mythology that sprang from kind of our age of progress and kind of added itself into kind of the pantheon of of monsters and the pantheon of mythology. Yeah, and I was I was complaining not too long ago that you know of the various kinds of monsters that that just got so iconic in part because of the Universal Studios movies sure. um, that, you know, I really wish one of them would have got their shot. Like, I mean, you've got Frankenstein, you've got Dracula, you've got all sorts of, you've even got a mummy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got some really iconic creatures, but Jekyll and Hyde doesn't, never really got its iconic image. You know, they're, it's not, it's really easy to draw like just a few lines and people can tell, oh, that's Frankenstein or, oh, that's Dracula. 
you know, but there's nothing for Jekyll and Hyde and, and some efforts to it, but nothing that really stuck. I'm thinking it's, it's a dang shame that Jekyll and Hyde didn't become more of a part of our culture. But then again, you look at its influence and absolutely it's become so much a part of our culture that we can't even tell that we're post Jekyll and Hyde human beings anymore. Cause <laughs> I mean, that's what, that's what prefigured Freud's idea that like your mind is at one singular thing uh, that what you think you are is actually built out of all these other things. Part of the, some of those things are things that you're not even actually aware of, but they're still part of you and they could rise up. And some of those things are not quite good, like a different conception of the complex human psyche beyond simple soul and sin kind of thing. And all of that came from, I mean, all of that came from Jekyll and Hyde. There was nothing before that that really got into that. And then, then you got Freud and Jung, and now we all think that we have personalities and, and various aspects of our own psyches for, for better or worse. <laughs> it's all Jekyll and Hyde, man. <laughs> but you can see, I, I think you could see the Genesis, you know, in the Christian worldview as well with the, uh, with the fallenness and that we're all tainted and that we can see in ourselves the greatness that we were supposed to be, but we also know that there is this depravity in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. You've got that. And I, and I guess I, you could say like that, that awareness that parts of yourself are mysteries to yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you've got that Hamlet, I guess, is where that really first shows oh, up. Yeah. And then, and then, and then Milton, you know, reads that and, and takes that running and kind of brings that back into Christianity. And then, but, uh, but the perhaps the starkest example, uh, still probably Jekyll and Hyde. I yeah, I'm not, I guess without, I mean, maybe Freud could have gotten where he got without Jekyll and Hyde coming first. Maybe Jekyll and Hyde's just an indicator that something like Freud was on its way. Mm-hmm. Um, if Freud probably couldn't have gotten where he got where he got without Hamlet. But anyway, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I like Jekyll and Hyde too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, just kind of wrap up our Frankenstein discussion just a little bit. I find it interesting that as we've been talking about, you know, Frankenstein has kind of imprinted itself onto our culture, has you can't grow up in, you know, without even hearing its name or something or seeing kind of the the, the Boris Karloff at least kind of influenced image. And I was just thinking, though, that it's just like like the original story. I, I'm just trying to think like if somebody did did a version that was very accurate to the novel. I'm just wondering how uh, you think that would play kind of in our in our modern culture. Oh, they'd hate it. They'd absolutely hate <laughs> it. Like you'd get a few, if it were good, you know, you'd get a few people like me saying, oh, it's like, it's, it's fantastic. It's the way it should have been. And you get a few more people who just are like, well, at least it's true to the book. But most people just absolutely reject it because you don't, they don't want it. Like, and while I said all that, I think Francis Ford Coppola's version of Dracula uh, was accepted pretty well, even though it was so distant from Bella Lugosi's version, mm-hmm. but not really any closer to the, not much closer to the yeah. books than, yeah. than the original one, the Universal Studios. I think, I think everyone would hate it, but who knows? It might just depend on how, how good it is. I think the one way you could do it is, is play with people a little bit and just call it something, the movie, just call it something like the modern Prometheus yeah. and just don't stay that it's Frankenstein in the title and then like bait them into it. And so that everyone's like, Oh, actually, you know what that is? That's actually a Frankenstein movie, but you know, and so let everybody think that they figured it out and that's closer to the book and then they'll love it. So maybe I'm underestimating people too much, but, <laughs> but I, I think it's just too, it's so iconic that people would generally hate it. That the, uh, the kind of an articulate Frankenstein is, is too much of a leap over the kind of the brutish Boris Karloff one. Yeah, you would, you would at least have to make them look different or or else it's bathos, you know, or else we're all just cracking up at like this real, well, I mean, it's like like in the end of Young Frankenstein, you know, after <laughs> after they switch brains and he's reading the newspaper with his glasses and it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, like, I mean, that, and that was part of the fun of the monsters and that came out in the 60s, right? Mm-hmm. This, this like supposed to be scary, brainless, brute monster thing, just 
just trying to like get through the day and go to work and mm. sort out his family problems. <laughs> That's the, that was funny. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I think it would come off funny rather <laughs> than than deep uh, unless he looked a lot different. Yeah, and it, you bring up an interesting point because uh, with the Munsters being already in the 1960s, we we went through a time when it could be parody, and now we're in like a post parody culture. So how do yeah. you, you know, how do you redeem something after it's been parodied uh, already? Yeah. Yeah, I think Jacques Barzun said something about our era of decadence and a decadent culture. The only art form left is satire. Satire, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was that was Barzun. Yeah, that is, that is fascinating. Okay, well, um, we'll just close out Frankenstein there. But before I let you go, since this is a role-playing game podcast, we were talking about, and since you're the monster expert and I have you on the line, um, <laughs> in role-playing games, since we're dealing with monsters kind of all the time, I thought it would be interesting to talk about kind of the origin of some of the monsters that we deal with in role-playing games. You know, I'll just take a very common category because obviously some monsters are original creations that are created for uh, Dungeons & Dragons, like say the Beholder or something like that, which is an IP (laughs) product um, that belongs to them. Just thinking of monsters that that are in literature and have a long history, just thinking of, say, goblins, orcs, and ogres. Maybe just start off with some of your thoughts about uh, these creatures, and I know they have a very, uh, very long history in mythology and literature. I guess the orcs kind of took over in the role playing world. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the, you see, I mean, I don't. I'm sure some people are out there playing goblin characters uh, or playing ogre characters, but many more mm-hmm. people have incorporated kind of orcs and that orc culture into into regular role playing and i mean the default monster you run into is what typically something like a band of orcs or something <laughs> um that's that's straight out of the tolkien like so like yeah. our concept of the fantasy genre like there was no real fantasy genre before tolkien now you can say well there's robert e howard conan stories and everything before mm-hmm. tolkien. well that's true but but still the the dungeons and dragons role playing fantasy game of thrones kind the world that we all kind of picture now with with warriors and wizards and dragons that's all Tolkien yeah and and our version of I mean an orc was essentially like an old English demon or malevolent spirit but I mean goblin was kind of like that too like you can find all sorts of references to to when characters are discussing uh, ghosts or evil spirits or something like that they just as frequently call them goblins as they do mm-hmm. demons or ghosts and you can find that in Shakespeare you can find that in Washington Irving you find that on all over the place and so and so orcs and goblins as more of well what what we now picture as orc this like you know brutish football playing kind of bad dental work kind of green skinned (laughs) beast kind of thing that you know just wants to run after you and it's hide armor and like hit you with a club or you know capture you or something Mm -hmm. that's all tolkien's version of that and so like a lot of things in role play it came from either greek mythology or tolkien (laughs) i think there are quite a there there are surprisingly few creatures or monsters that the dungeons and dragons folk or the gary gygax kind of came up with um, on his own a lot of it was imported elsewhere um but definitely orcs uh tolkien's version of old English and Scandinavian kind of images of, you know, their stories about the evil spirits. And then also um, the Scandinavian and old English versions of like trolls, ogres, and giants, all of which were interchangeable in the older stuff. Like so many monster categories, like mermaids and sirens, we like to think of as different now, but they were the same thing a few hundred years back. And and the same thing with trolls, giants, and ogres. And so he kind of brought those in and, and gave them life. And of course, called them goblins and in the Hobbit, and then mm-hmm. uh, that was too French of a word for Tolkien, <laughs> who very, cared very much about language and had a very eventually got a much 
clearer idea of what he wanted to recreate. And so he dumped the romantic or the Latinate words as much as possible in the Lord of the Rings and brought it back to orcs. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's where those guys came from in in a nutshell. For examples in literature, would you say something like, was Grendel an ogre? Yeah, Grendel's a great idea. Grendel's an oddity too, because he doesn't because you get no clear image of what Grendel is. And at mm-hmm. one point, the I mean, obviously, he's something physical. He's something there that can mm-hmm. break into the house. He can have his arm ripped off and yeah. run away screaming. He can eat people. <laughs> so he's something very physical. It's not like a wraith, how we consider a wraith or something mm-hmm. now, which is also from Tolkien. <laughs> but, um, but then the Beowulf poet calls him a damned spirit of hell in one yeah. line. And Tolkien's notes on that are kind of disturbed and conflicted. And he's like working out the logic, like how can the Beowulf poet, as brilliant as he is, not know that you can't be a damned spirit of hell and be outside of hell and (laughs) be physical? You know, what happens when he dies? What's going to happen? And so so he worked out this kind of version and and a lot of it's been published in in the in the Tolkien version of Beowulf that Christopher Tolkien put out, which is absolutely brilliant. I think we're mm-hmm. I don't know, we're probably a decade away from scholars taking that one seriously, but they they will eventually because yeah. it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. But he, his notes kind of work that out as in like you can see that he imagines like a lot of people did Grendel being this troll like thing or this Mm -hmm. orc like thing, but also something like an evil spirit or a demon or perhaps insubstantial. And so I think it, I think it's Michael drought, maybe Corey Olson who, who come, who came up with this concept that that was that Tolkien played out his theories on Grendel in the ring wraiths as these things that could simultaneously be damned and dead and yet here and physical simultaneously. And how did they go through this process of being both simultaneously? Um, and so that's one of the brilliant things that he did with ring wraiths. But I mean, I mean, my, my Beowulf professor in college who dedicated his life and his scholarship to Beowulf, I asked him one day, like, what did Grendel look like? Just give me a straight answer. (laughs) Was he furry? Was he scaly? Like, what was this guy? And his answer is, we don't know. (laughs) The Beowulf poet apparently assumed that everybody else would know it well enough that he didn't have to describe it, or he didn't care and neither did they. We just don't know. (laughs) A writer or an author always comes up to the to the problem. Do you describe it enough so it becomes uh, so tangible that it loses its mysterious, you know, kind of the mystery about it? Or do you leave it uh, so that the the uh, readers or the audience's imagination can kind of concoct their own image of the creature? Yeah. And, and I clearly have picked one path and can't help myself. I'm as concrete as possible. <laughs> and so uh, and a, a colleague one time called me a realist writer after he read my novel, The Black Palace, which is full of like witches and ghosts and werewolves and vampires and every type of monster. <laughs> and he called me a realist. And then by that, he meant like, I can't help but make everything constantly concrete like i don't like having any sort of vague is it just a metaphor or symbolic or kind of interpret it yourself kind of thing i want i want my concrete version of every monster right in your i want it to have weight and i want it you to feel it and, <laughs> and i can't help myself on that and uh, guillermo del toro is like the the director version of that with much more talent i think he always <laughs> he always wants you to see the monster yeah. uh, which is pretty cool why why do you think you take that route i know i can't help it i love i love <laughs> my, i love i don't know i just love monsters so much that given an opportunity to to make one and make it come to life i i can't i can't pass up that chance of of designing it and and make making it feel real i think and and i don't know like i get like I'm not saying that it's unwise 
to hide the terror or that something is scarier if it's not seen. But I also don't think I'm, a, although I've kind of now been lumped in as a horror writer, I don't think I'm a scary writer. I don't think my stuff is necessarily scary. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's, I think it just deals with, you know, horror like content. Um, and I think Tolkien was this, and maybe that comes from some of my influences, Lovecraft and Tolkien, both mm-hmm. of whom were d- concrete to the extreme. Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. I don't know. I just can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we're still thinking about goblins and, you know, I, you know, I mentioned Grendel, but is there, um, or orcs, is there s- something else in literature that where, you know, kind of maybe pre Tolkien where we can see something, a, a goblin or something like that? Um, yeah, the, for goblins, they showed up in all sorts of folk tales, um, long before Tolkien. And then in, I mean, you've got them in, You've got them in a lot of Scandinavian stuff or some mm-hmm. version of them. You've got these like dwarf like characters who are characters who apparently shape change quite a bit. You've got trolls that at any given point are are goblin like as quickly as they are giant like. Um but in and you've got all sorts of folk tales that everything from like those uh those malevolent little embodied spirits that haunt ruins in mm-hmm. you know in in you know the british isles all the way to the tommy knockers of like the oh, kentucky yeah. coal mines you know they would hear a knock 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 when they're deep down in the mines and they mm-hmm. were these little kobolds or it was mm-hmm. some of them were the the german immigrants bring in the stories of the kobolds yeah. which were essentially goblin like things in the mines mm-hmm. and you would hear the knocking before a cave in or before someone would die and so you would get this sense that ended up you know, and bought and becoming embodied in, in World War II with the gremlins on the plane. Oh, yeah. So like every time something would go wrong in the plane, they would blame a gremlin, this goblin like thing that worked itself into the system and, and kind of tore things apart. Um, and so, yeah, that, that our current image of it has been around for quite some time. I think mm-hmm. at least for, for hundreds of years. And if you want to stretch interpretation out, then you can probably find some stuff in classical mythology too, Mm -hmm. uh, of these, of these troublesome little, well, satyrs aren't too ungoblin, goblin like, especially when they're causing trouble. Yeah. I think it's interesting, you know, usually in kind of role-playing game circles, you will hear things like a goblin or an orc or an ogre or something that they're, they've been kind of robbed of their, of their mythical qualities, right? They're just, you're just going to run into a band of goblins when you're level, you know, two, and you're going to run into a band of orcs when you're level five, <laughs> you know, and yeah. you're gonna, you know, then you might have to fight an ogre or a couple ogres when you're level eight, <laughs> because they're just stair steps in, you know, in power, have more hit points and et cetera. What would you say about something like that, where if you were just throwing goblins, you know, if you're just using goblins, have they really just been robbed of kind of all their mythical qualities since we just kind of throw them in a game and say they have how many ever hit points? No, man, you got to respect your monsters. You got to let them, you got to <laughs> let them be more of what they really are. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know much about Pathfinder, although it, it, it has grown quite a bit in popularity, but I remember my first my first encounter with it was that it was it was trying to go back to common role playing kind of images like the goblin or the ogre, ogre and then and take it seriously or at least give it a different glimpse. And so as I as I remember they kind of made goblins a little bit more like gremlins from the Steven Spielberg film mixed with stitch from Lilo and stitch like this intense, capable little mischief maker that in just, you know, in sheer numbers and wicked ingenuity could like bring a whole city down (laughs) if it wanted to. (laughs) And I mean, you know, like spend a little bit in time thinking about what's really, I mean, have you seen Gremlins, one of the scariest Christmas movies (laughs) out there? Like those little dudes, the, and Gremlins too, as insane as that thing is, (laughs) 
<laughs> the the underlying story is that they're all i mean you know some uh, key and pill do a wonderful sketch about <laughs> how awful gremlins to the writing room must have been um and something about it was somebody brought up like what if we do die hard grim meets gremlins <laughs> right so they're all trapped in this like skyscraper downtown new york building but the reason they're trapped in there because the security system fail like the whole the underlying storyline is that as soon as they get out as soon as night falls and then they decide to leave the building, then they're just going to take over New York and multiply so much that before daybreak, they will have brought about the end of the entire world. Like that's how fast they can multiply and cause damage. And so you're watching a pre-apocalyptic movie when you're watching the Gremlins movies. (laughs) These guys are one step away from taking over the world and they can do it maybe in one night. Like these look like, Goblins can be that dangerous if you think about the kinds of, if you just have a whole bunch of little creatures that live for nothing but to mess stuff up and cause as much pain, confusion, and torment as possible, and they're pretty capable of doing that, man, just like a half dozen goblins can cause all sorts of trouble. So if you just like make them act like little knights, like put little swords in their hands and make you make them fight characters one-on-one that's not a goblin man the (laughs) goblin will like mess your world up and the goblin will like steal your id and get your girlfriend to dump you and so your mind's like 10 other places while you're in the middle of a dungeon and then you trip over something and then you accidentally drink some poison and then you turn on your buddies and you're all killing each other by the end of it and goblins dipped it all man and so anyway that's my advice (laughs) i think that's fantastic i know i know you mentioned uh that it was spielberg i think it was produced by spielberg but it was directed by uh, joe dante the grim oh okay <laughs> sorry joe <laughs> <laughs> but no i i think your your take uh right there is is absolutely correct that we've just uh perhaps game masters are just so overworked and tired that we just say, okay, there's six goblins now fight them <laughs> or something. <laughs> but in, instead of uh, kind of working in some of those things and letting people know that yes, goblins, they're out to destroy the world. Um, this is not just, uh, they're just not here to uh, kind of slow you up or make you use a few arrows or something like that. Yeah. They're, they're out to destroy the world. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Josh, um, again, this has been fantastic having you on the show again. I could keep talking about monsters all day (laughs) um, with you, but I will let you go. (laughs) We've been talking for a long time. So um, as always, uh, in the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com, I will link up uh, your website and your novels uh, so people can check them out. And uh, so, Josh, just thank you for being on the show again. Oh, man, thank you so much. I've had a blast. It's been a blast both times times uh, continued success on the show and uh keep keep bringing those monsters to life in game or otherwise man it's been great talking to you well there you have it guys i really hope you enjoyed this conversation uh with josh today i just have a blast every time josh is on the show i could talk to josh about monsters mythology literature forever I think Um, he is just a wealth of knowledge on that topic and I enjoy it so much and I hope you enjoy it as well. As always, I have linked up Josh's podcast, The Monster Professor, as well as his books in the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com. Now, if you want some free stuff, go to DiceGeeks.com slash free. You will get 10 free dungeon maps and some other RPG resources that you can use in your RPG campaigns. You will also never miss an episode of this show. If you like these interviews, please head over to patreon.com slash dice geeks and consider supporting the show every bit of support that i get on patreon just lets me know that i should continue doing this show now i thank you for listening and until next time keep gaming